Wednesday's holiday, <coughs> then Friday. So two lectures, and I've gone through this stuff uh, in the last few years, but now the good news is it's all typed, and you have it for yourself. And the bad news is that I have to go, th I will go through it uh, slowly and explain the big major issues. So it's, if I was going to give you some uh, useful information in how to give a lecture in mathematics, the useful information is this is not a good way to do it because it gives too much information to the audience and it's hard to follow. On the other hand, the equations <coughs> and the idea is somehow complicated. So th if I either ignore the details, in which case it's just uh, talk and not seeing any, any of the uh, underlying details, or it's all details and no, uh, you get, can get confused what's important and what's not. So doing it this way, I can go slowly and point out what's important and that way finish in two presentations. So I'll see how far I get today and then continue to the next time. Uh, as uh, some a uh, advertising, what we end up with at the end is somehow, if you th think about it, which is uh, that, uh, whatever it was, 2007, 2008, so Perelman won a million dollars, which he did not put in his pocket, so uh, for solving the Poincaré conjecture. So he got the Fields Medal, which he declined, and the million dollars, which he would not accept. Okay, and it was the proof of the Poincaré conjecture is based on solving a partial differential equation. Okay, now the isometric embedding problem, the way I uh, formulated. Again, you could change it into proving the existence of a global smooth solution to a system of partial differential equations, initial value problem. And if that initial value problem has a solution that just as in Perelman's proof approaches some constant solution, you've solved the isometric embedding problem globally, which would be a major breakthrough. So I don't expect the major breakthrough, so my guess is both the uh, analogy to the Ricci flow, which I give, will give here, and the isometric embedding, it's not true. But you can set up the same sort of story. So it's the nice uh, interplay between differential geometry and evolution equations in PDE. Okay, so first, let's see if this works. So that's the title. And so let's get to the issue. So here, let's, okay, so here I'll use so, that's the problem. It's a very simple uh, system of PDs to solve. You give me a G. Can you see it? Is it too far, too small? Maybe we can make it bigger. That's, that's the bigger. Okay, is it possible? I, okay. That's better. Okay, good. Yeah, it's fine, it's fine, that's good. Uh, oh, you want 140? Even better. Okay, that's even better. That, oh, okay, we don't have to be perfect. So, as a system of partial differential equations, it's to solve a system of partial di differential equations, you give me g i j, i and j run through a system of coordinates, and you solve for the y. So y is a vector, and it says the gradient of uh, y dotted with the gradient, with the i direction dotted with the gradient and j direction gives us the g, which is nothing more than P Pythagoras' theorem. Pythagoras tells us how to find distance on a surface. So that's all there is to it, so I'll draw my favorite uh, picture. So all it says, in the easy case is you give me a surface 
And how would you find the distance along the surface, say between those two points? You'd say given the, if you knew the surface, you know the G. But the PDE problem is the reverse. Given the G, can you find the surface? So that would be the, as I say, in, inverse problem. Okay, so it's a classic problem in uh, differential geometry. Let's continue. Okay, so the, all this is, so it's a lot of sections, so, but I'll try to go through slowly and have two times. Okay, so there's some new ideas here that are introduced into the story. Okay, so let's continue. So there's the same picture, a little more weirdly drawn to exaggerate that it may not even have a graph-like representation globally, but the existence of the surface should be independent of the coordinate system. The surface doesn't know about its coordinate systems. So for example, in the classic story, which is, it's a two-dimensional manifold, two dimensions because it just going on the manifold is just a two-dimensional object, but it's lying in three dimensions. So that's why they use the, the two. Okay. So in that case, uh, we could do this, the story again. And here's the picture in two dimensions. Usually in an undergraduate course, we might write the third component as a function of the x1 and x2, so it looks like a graph. Okay, then we would write down Pythagoras' theorem, okay? And this would tell us, as I said, the g's. So given the f, we can find the g's. But our problem is the reverse. Given the g's, can we find the f? Now, as I repeat, what are you, of course, no requirement to remember anything I've said in the past, but this is a uh, nonlinear system of partial differential equations. In fact, it's fully nonlinear, which is the worst possible case because it's not even easy, doesn't fall into any of the obvious uh, types that we know from uh, elementary courses. Okay. In higher dimensions, Okay, I can go up a little. The, the G instead of being two by two becomes N by N and it's symmetric. So if you count the number of terms on the diagonal and above the diagonal, it's easy. It's, so it's N times N minus one, N plus one divided by two. So it tells you exactly the number of equations if you want to have the same number of equations as unknowns. So that's what we would call a determined system of differential equations. Of course it's possible to have more unknowns than equations and fewer unknowns than equations. So more unknowns than equations is better and fewer is worse. Okay. <clears throat> In the case of more unknowns than equations then the problem can be reduced if you have a lot more unknowns than equations then the problem in some sense can be reduced to an <coughs> algebraic problem. So if it's underdetermined, that makes it easier. This is the hard case to determine, and this is the case where you don't expect many solutions, so more or less you should have very little flexibility, or geometers call it rigidity. So, and this is the, somehow, the challenging one. So, Okay, so as I give the reference, so in the case of uh, many more equations than, many more unknowns than equations, the uh, main result was uh, first given by uh, Nash in the 1950s, and he proved you can solve the problem globally. Okay, so this, and this has been improved, the number has been improved over the years, and the best numbers now by uh, Gromov and Gunther, so the number is lowered. I was always curious, how did Nash come up with this uh, 
strange number. So, but in the interview with Nash on the web, Charlie Pfefferman is interviewing Nash on the Simons Foundation website. And I recommend always to read the interview with uh, Nash. It's rather interesting. And Pfefferman asked, how did you come up with the number? And Nash says, well, I knew some big number would work, and I was tired. Nothing deeper than that. He says, I, roughly, I'm, you can check the exact quote, but he says, I'm t I was tired. So I saw this number would work, so I didn't want to work, I was tired. I've been working on this problem, and I was, didn't want to work on it anymore. So I picked a, the, uh, the num a number that I saw would work. So if you're looking for somehow that there must be some deep philosophy behind such a great man, Nobel Prize winner like Nash, what was he thinking? He was thinking like everybody else. I'm tired, I want to go to sleep. <laughs> what number will work? Okay, finish, publish the paper, I don't want to see it anymore. So Nash, in some sense, was very human as to why. So it's not surprising that later mathematician like Ramov could find a better number. And the question is, what's the best number? And nobody knows. So if, if you think about what the issue are, we know Nash's number or Gromov's number work for global embedding, and under some conditions you can get local embedding, but there's a gap between the local theory with a small number, say this Genet dimension, and the global theory, and what's in between, nobody knows. So I have my guesses, okay, that there's, there's something in between. Okay. So, <coughs> here's a, a quote from uh, S.T. Yao, which I you can get again on the web, but I wrote it all out here. <coughs> and uh, so Yao says that this uh, problem, precisely this case, N, o, N times N plus 1 over tau, he said it is important to understand this problem with this optimal dimension. Okay, now if Yao says something is important, I believe him. Okay, okay. He doesn't know everything, but in geometry he sure knows a lot. Okay. <coughs> okay, and he gives us a reference. The major work on this subject was done by, uh, it's written Berger, but he, it's French-Canadian, so I'll pronounce Berger, Bryant. Robert Bryant was uh, at Berkeley, now at Berkeley. Griffiths had been at Harvard, and then he was director of the Institute for Advanced Study uh, in Princeton, and now he's retired, but still in Princeton. And Dean Yang is at uh, what is now part of New York University, and he helps me with this subject. Everything I learned about this subject, I learned from Dean Yang. Okay. Okay, so, so that's the quote from Chern. Oh, by the way, <coughs> Chern, uh, Yao quotes this part, he, he actually has a type of, anyways, he says, Chern told me that he and Hans Levy studied the, the problem on a three manifold into six dimensions, but they didn't write any manuscript on it. Okay, his English isn't quite good. But this is an important, and you can get some discussion of this paper. The main point of view from the point of view of PDE is the result of Chern and Levy says, no matter how you write down the problem in three dimensions, that is not two like here, two-dimensional manifold, but three, one higher dimension, drastic change. Because in this one, the equations, no matter how you write them, if you linear, will either be more or less hyperbolic or elliptic. So if you like elliptic theory, you can choose a location where you, or some problem where you can do elliptic theory. If you like hyperbolic, you can rig it up some problem solving hyperbolic equations. <coughs> but this Chern-Levy result is no points of ellipticity. Now, what does that mean from a 
point of view of mathematicians, not mathematics, mathematicians, mathematicians then will divide often into people who do elliptic problems and people who do hyperbolic problems. Okay. And, okay. So, so the elliptic people are immediately out of the game because their methods cannot work in a problem that's not elliptic. So no maximum principles. So they had to devise other methods. Now, as Yao says, that Berger, Brian, Griffiths, Yang, they used them something called equations of real principle type. Well, that's like uh, micro-local analysis. Okay. Rather complicated, and it's based on linearizing this fully nonlinear system. And the point that I tried to raise here is at least in some of the cases, you can avoid that whole micro complicated story and reduce it to the same theorems that we would, methods that we would use in normal everyday PDE theory. Contraction map should work. So you don't need the sophisticated theory. Okay, so now this is not important. It's just another, I mentioned Poincaré, there's something. So the, it's just <coughs> saying that if you have equality of cross partials, okay, you can find the potential. So it's the usual rule for finding a potential, which is the equality of cross partials, which is called the Poincaré lemma. Okay. Poincaré lemma. So why is that important? Because <coughs> Poincaré lemma says if you have equality of cross partials, then you can find in, here, as it's here, so some function in equality of cross partials means that Fi can be written as a somebody with partial with respect to xj, and fj can be written as a somebody as a partial with respect to, is that right? Fi can be written as a partial with respect to xi, fj can be written as a partial with respect to xj, and it's just saying equality of cross partials. Why is that imp <coughs> important? We teach it in maybe third semester math. Okay. And the answer is because we change the PD problem into just solving an equation of that form. So we set things up with equality of cross partials. If the equality of cross partials is satisfied, we've solved the problem. So that's just a way to end up doing the PDEs. Okay, that's not important. Now some <coughs> rules of the road. <coughs> and that's why I, it's useful to have the thing here. It gets rather complicated. So why all this story? And the answer is uh, simple, common sense, nothing deep. Okay, if you want to, if I give you information on a surface, let's say we're now walking along on the surface of the earth, and you want information that you can compute by walking on the surface of the earth. Okay, that means you can't, you, if you want to know derivatives, first derivatives, second derivatives, third derivatives, etc., it's illegal <coughs> to fly. You are not Superman or Superwoman, okay, or a bird, <laughs> okay. So you cannot get information by going off the surface of the Earth. So everything you can compute only makes sense to compute as you're walking on the surface of the Earth. The language in geometry is it's called intrinsic. It has to be intrinsic to the surface. So that means if you want to differentiate, it only makes sense to be able to differentiate from information on the surface here. So in two dimensions it's clear. So it should be based on information that can be attained only on the surface. So for example, the scale is no problem. The intrinsic, okay, covariant derivative is the same as your usual partial derivative. <coughs> But the intrinsic covariant derivative of a vector, you have to subtract something off to project you back. You take the usual and then project yourself back onto the 
manifold. So that's first derivatives, you get the rule very quickly. So no derivatives, no subtractions. One derivative, one subtraction. Two derivatives, two subtractions. N derivatives, N subtractions. And it's just a bookkeeping to write down all the things. <coughs> the subtraction coefficients are called the Christoffel symbols. Okay. They only depend on the original metric. So you give me the G, you know how to subtract. Okay, so there's the formula for the Christoffel symbol, so it's based on first derivatives of the G. <coughs> if you differentiate one more time and do things, you get second derivatives of the G, and this combination is called the Riemann curvature tensor. So all it does is generalize Riemann himself. He was trying to generalize what Gauss has done before him, thesis advisor, the good student tries to generalize what the thesis advisor did. Okay, so Gauss was the thesis advisor, Riemann was the good student, Gauss had invented the theory of surfaces, not bad, and he realized that the intrinsic concept of curvature here was the Gauss curvature. So the intrinsic was the Gauss curvature. Okay, <coughs> so more or less, as you probably remember, for example, the sphere has Gauss curvature, it's a plus number, whereas the vase like that has, goes in, so the Gauss curvature is some negative number. Okay, so that takes us along, so you get all the, now you see why I used the thing, because things start getting a little messy, but the idea is simple. That's why. Okay, so that's the Gauss curvature. So, you can imagine, if I'm giving you the G, remember the problem is given the G, find the Y's. So if I give you the G's, and the Gauss curvature is determined from the G's, that means I know the R's. Not only the Gauss curvature, I know th the general case. So Gauss curvature is just the case of two dimensions. In general, it's the Riemann curvature tensor. Okay, but it, nevertheless, if I know the G's, I know the gammas, I know the R. So this is all known stuff for our PDE problem. It's the right-hand side. No matter what you want to think of it, it's given some, you want to solve a set of, set of equations, and you have to have something given and what's given is the right-hand side of the equation, and this is stuff that goes on the right-hand side. I guess if you're left-handed, maybe it's on the left-hand side, but I always think of it as on the right-hand side. Okay. Okay. So, everybody happy so far? I'm going slowly, but what's the rush? Okay. Okay, so this uh, Gauss curvature, and not Gauss curvature, it's the Riemann curvature tensor, has some identities. The two principal ones, okay, is some interchanging, some symmetry and skew symmetry, which is here, and then two Bianchi identities, Bianchi being an Italian mathematician, geometer. So this is the first Bianchi, which is included in here. So this one and this one are the same. And this one is a divergence, because this semicolon, if you can see it, that's the, that's the covariant derivative with respect to some direction mu. So it's like a divergence. Okay, so it says the divergence of the Riemann curvature tensor is zero. So we get some a priori information on divergences. Where do we so see such things? And I always make a point about it. It should not, not be, it should be familiar if you ever thought about Navier-Stokes equations or Euler equations. This has the immediate analog in fluid mechanics of what's usually thought of as an incompressibility condition, divergence of the velocity equals zero. So it's some statement that our solution will have to satisfy this. If, if R determines the solution, that means the solution, this value is somehow 
going to give us information on the solution and this divergence rule will have to be satisfied. So far, so good? Okay. Okay, this is uh, another way to think of the uh, Riemann curvature tensor is it's uh, again a differentiation of the Christoffel symbols which is saying nothing more than the derivatives don't compute. The kth derivative of ij minus the jth derivative of ik is not equal to zero except in flat space. So the lack of commutivity of the derivatives is the curvature tensor. Okay, this is not interesting. Okay, so here again I restate the problem. Another way to write it. Okay, okay there's the picture again. Okay, so now how do we go about setting up the equations? Now there's two possibilities. Okay, possibility number one. Possibility number one from the point of view of PD is no geometry is solve the fully nonlinear system. Okay. So I wrote it, I'll write it here again. It's, it's there. So possibility number one is to solve this system of equations. That's fully nonlinear. Fully nonlinear system, this a lot of papers about fully nonlinear system. You can find discussions among other plays. I think Evans has on his website from UC Berkeley a whole discussion. <coughs> He's written survey articles, Suganides, Pierre Louis Leon's, lots of papers on fully nonlinear problems. But if you get to underneath, as I said, if you trace it all the way through, okay, at the bottom line, as far as I can tell, I might be wrong, there's always an assumption that when you linearize the fully nonlinear system, it's going to be elliptic. But I just said in higher dimensions, beyond the surface, no ellipticity. So, <coughs> trying to use their theory, so-called viscosity methods, for such a problem, as far as I can see, just their methods will not apply. Doesn't mean their methods aren't good. Just means they won't apply. So if you may look in the literature, as far as I know, and take the intersection of the number of papers on isometric embedding in n greater than or equal to three, it's a bit of a joke, but not. Okay. So here's n greater than or equal to three papers on isometric embedding. Here's all the papers on viscosity methods. And the intersection is exactly like that, empty. And it makes sense. Yeah. So, so of course, what do the people do who like viscosity methods and who like uh, isometric embedding? And it's useful, and of course, is they do. And then the intersection is, so they just do the problem they can do. Okay, so now we're going to try to set up another set of equations. So instead of doing quasi, uh, fully nonlinear, let's try to write the problem as quasi linear. Okay. Quasi linear has its advantage because you don't need special theories. Okay. And how do we prove quasi existence theorems for quasi linear? Doesn't make any difference. Conservation laws, any quasi linear system you, you have, more or less. Usually contraction mapping works because the iterator, you set up an iteration scheme and it's quasi linear. Things don't get much worse as you iterate around. So there's certain preference from the point of view of analysis to use quasi-linear theory. Okay, so how do we do it? So I'll go back to my picture because the picture is 
useful. Where is the eraser? The eraser was over there. So let's use this picture. I have it again there, but it's the most important picture of the whole thing, which everybody, it's easy to see here in two dimensions, and then you just generalize it. So in two dimensions, what do you do? You make a tangent, I hope that's, so this differentiate in this direction gives a tangent. Differentiate in that direction gives a tangent of y. Okay, take the cross product, you get a normal. So this is, say D, if this is x1, this is x2, this is dy1, d2y, so that gives tangents, you can normalize them, make them unit tangents if you want, and then take the cross product, normalize it by its absolute value, magnitude, whatever, it's not absolute, okay? By this magnitude and you make it a unit vector. It doesn't make any difference, plus sign or minus sign. Okay. So we've set up a coordinate system on the surface. Okay. So then all we have to do is start differentiating guys and decompose them into components in the tangent plane, which is, of course, here and in the normal direction. So anybody can be decomposed into those two uh, groups. So what do we do in higher dimensions? Okay. Exactly the same thing, except there's no cross product. So we just assume that the manifold has, uh, the surface, if you want to think of it, has a bunch of normals and a bunch of tangents, and they're orthogonal. Oh, I should remark, okay, sometimes there's some confusion, and it sounds rather f impressive. So in the, some people talk about hypersurfaces. So what's a hypersurface? A hypersurface is, if you have an n-dimensional manifold, Okay. The hypersurface would be that it's an n plus an n plus one dimensional space. So exactly the classical surface is a uh, so it's embedded into n plus one dimensional Euclidean space. So for example, n equal to two meant we were embedded in three dimensions, which is a classical surface. But n equal to 3 would mean we were embedded into four dimensions, which is the hypersurface, but that's way too few dimensions in general. So the appearance of a higher dimensional a hypersurface would be rather unusual. Okay. So the problem, whereas I'm considering, would be here that it's embedded into 6, because it's n times n plus 1 over 2, which if I do the math right, I see that's, so that's 3 times 4, which is 12 divided by 2, which is 6. So I have a lot more freedom, and even that problem's hard. So this problem, okay, only is very special cases. So the existence of a hypersurface, okay, th there exist such things, but uh, not easy. Okay, so now what do we do? So we have tangents and normals. So let's think about it. So let's say I differentiated one of the tangents. Well, it won't be a tangent necessarily, and it won't be a normal, but it'll be a linear combination of normals because that's the, it spans the vector space. So you do just your usual orthogonal decomposition of linear algebra. So there it is. Okay, I use the red. It says, you take a first derivative and now differentiate one more time, you get a second derivative, that's pretty obvious. And then you decompose 
it into tangent pieces and normal pieces. Okay, and the coefficients have names. So the coefficient here, and I give the proof here, but it's not uh, worth going through. So the coefficients here in the tangent, tangent direction are your old friend, the Christoffel symbols, and the coefficient in the normal direction, by definition, is the second fundamental form. Okay, whatever that coefficient is, call it H and give it a name. And the name is the second fundamental form. It's nothing more than a name. Okay, I could have called it, who knows, Brooklyn Dodgers, okay, Los Angeles Dodgers. Didn't make any difference, it's just a name. Okay, okay. All right. The same thing we can do. Okay, that's the proof, that's a little more proof, so, okay. Where was the, do the same thing in the normal. Differentiate the normal, it's gonna have a tangent piece and a normal piece. Again, nothing deep. Okay, the tangent piece, well again, a little work shows has to be the second fundamental form multiplied by the inverse of G. Up, upstairs letters means inverse. Okay? But it's some multiple of the second fundamental form. Again, a leftover guy. The coefficients of the normal direction. Okay? Give it a name. You can call it anything you want, but the name that is used is Okay, some people use different names, but the official name is uh, connections okay, on, on the normal bundle. But that's completely irrelevant. To me, the only thing is it's a letter. <laughs> okay. okay. The I tells us is indexing the number of space dimension. U and N okay, is the difference here. Let's do here. So let's do n equal to 3. Okay. So n equal to 3 means there are numbers 1, 2, 3, that's where the xi's live. And then numbers 4, 5, 6, because there are six dimensions. So the mu's and the eta's live over here, 4, 5, 6. And the xi's, the i's, live over here, 1, 2, 3. So mu and a to go there. So no matter what, the first bunch will always be the space derivatives and the mu at five, six, okay? They're just counting how many guys you have for the second fundamental forms. Nothing very deep. And the same thing, the counting here. Now this guy is Q symmetric in mu and eta, so when mu equals uh, mu and nu. So when mu equals nu, it's zero. Okay. Okay, so that's that. And that's some things. Here's the skew symmetry. Oh, I could use this. Okay. So nothing very fancy. So let's see. So what did I do so far? I didn't do anything, I just wrote down what it looks like should be a generalization, generalization of that picture, and I just differentiated one more time. Not very deep. So now I, we differentiated once to get tangents and normals. We differentiated twice to get these representations. Now we differentiate one more time. So it's just a question of bookkeeping. So we'll differentiate one more time. Okay, so for example, here's the, what we had before, and we differentiate one more time. Why do we differentiate one more time? Because the whole point is we differentiate first i, then j, and then we'll differentiate i, then j, and whatever equations they get, since these i and j for smooth functions, okay, should commute, it's just normal partial derivatives, means whatever equations we get, will be necessary conditions for solving our problem. So we do that. 
and it's a bookkeeping exercise. And the good, that's the bad news. The good news is you have it in the notes and I worked it out for you. So you'll never have to, you'll never, you keep it, put it in the laptop, whatever, and you'll have it forever if you ever want it. So you equate cross partials, okay? And then of course, this is going to be a statement of tangent stuff, normal stuff, tangent stuff, normal stuff. Well, tangent stuff has to balance tangent stuff, normal stuff has to balance normal stuff, okay? It's just that the tangents and normal span the vector space. So you do that, okay, and you get that equation. So it gives us an equation for these A's. That equation has a name. Okay, it's a system of nine equations called the Ricci equations. So same mathematician Ricci, this Ricci here, Ricci curvature, Ricci flow, Poincaré conjecture, million dollars. Same guy. But Ricci didn't live long enough for the million dollars, but okay, same guy. So Ricci lived, I guess, if I'm not mistaken, about 1920. Okay. Okay. So now we can do the same thing that was with the A's, then we'll do the same thing with the So I did that wherever I go too fast. So let's do what was I doing with, with the did the Ricci's with the Kodatsis? I don't know where I did it. Okay, so that's one I should say then when we do the that's balance this is the Ricci follow from balancing in the normal direction. From the balancing in the tangential direction, let's go back a little, a little. Go. So, in the tangential direction, okay, we get another system of equations for the H's. And here it is. But you can clean that up. So I clean it up here. You don't want to, I, I showed you the, the cleaning up process. Okay. So, it's always the possibility when you write stuff up, you can say, it's an exercise for the student or it can be shown, but I wanted in these lecture notes to leave nothing un, in doubt, so I worked it out. Okay, so here's the cleaning up thing. And here's the uh, Kodatsu equation, very simple. So it just says, again, looks the same. It always looks like a curl. Okay, if you think of uh, curls and so it says the cross partials of the second fundamental form are not zero. This something that enters from the A's, this uh, connections on the normal bundle. So then we have two sets of equations. But I hadn't done the same cross partials. That was with the N's. Okay. But let's do, uh, go back on instant replay here. But let's do the same equivalence of equality of cross partials on the y's. So this is the tangents. Okay, so again I, and these should be equal. Should be zero. So you grind it out. And what do we get? Okay, I'll tell you again. Okay. You get, again, the Kodatsu equation. So you produce one set of equations you already w knew was true. But you get something more. You also get, so before we got, I'll repeat it, so differentiating with normals we got Ricci and Kodatsi. Differentiating with tangents we got Kodatsi, not Ricci, and something new. And it's this algebraic identity which is called, again, Gauss relation. In this subject, it's either Gauss-Ricci 
and that's it. I mean, there's only this, these names are used over and over again because these guys had done the basic work. So let's put it all together. I wrote, we summarized below. So these are the equations. So I've derived the necessary conditions for solving this problem. And it was nothing more really than differentiating over and over again. So the necessary conditions for solving that problem are an algebraic condition, which is the Gauss relation. Okay, an algebraic. And then two sets of partial differential equations the Kazatsi equations and the Ricci equations. And you can clean up the Ricci equations if you want, make them a little prettier, but that's not important. So, what did we get? Okay, we want to solve this system which was determined. Same number of equations as unknowns. We go through all this differentiation process, classical, going back to the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, we get Oh, go back. Where's my? We got Kodatsi, Ricci, and the Gauss was before. An algebraic relationship. So, the first intuition might be, if this had the same number of equations as unknowns, then this new formulation would have the same number of equations as unknowns. But it's not true. So, if I some. What does it tell you? If you start off with the same number of equations as unknowns, and you go through this differentiation process, and you get more equations than unknowns, common sense tells you all it means is the some of the equations are repeated. You can't get something from nothing. So it has to be ex repeated. The question is, which ones are repeated? That's not so easy. And surprisingly, as I say, I said it before, I say it again, seems to me, that the experts who, Brian Griffiths and Yang, as far as I know, and I've talked to Yang, I've never met, I've seen Griffiths in Wisconsin, I never spoke to him, Bryant I spoke to once, nice guy, okay. But as far as I know, by reading their fundamental paper and subsequent papers, the people who are the experts in this subject, working in pure math, had never read and knew that there was a paper existed in the literature, was there, that they could read off who's dependent and who's independent. It was there for the reading. It was sitting around since 1950s. But they didn't go look. If you don't look, you don't find. Okay. In fact, I found it by the simplest way you could find anything. I typed it in on Google, and you go down the list and you have a little patience, and it wasn't Google number one, it was Google number 20, I don't know. You have to go down, blah, 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 and you find the paper, and then that one refers. So they could have done a web check, but of course when they were doing their original research was the 1980s, so no Google. And they never went back to the problem, so... But that the newer people in the subject didn't go and do a Google search is rather surprising. Okay, that's their choice, but hopefully after they will read this, they'll know that they, this, the problem is worked out. That part is worked out. Okay, so what's the... Uh, Theorem, roughly, okay, it's here. Okay, it just says the obvious. I said if you have a solution, it must solve this system of equations. Kadatsi, which is PDEs, Ricci, which is PDEs, and Gauss, which is algebra. Okay, so that's necessary. But the theorem is the necessary is also sufficient. Why is the necessary also sufficient? Because 
it says nothing more that if you solve the necessary, then you have equality of course partials, and then once you have equality of course partials, you have the potential, you've solved the problem. And another way we deal with it is everybody's taken the lowest level undergraduate PDE course, and there's something called, the subject always called exact equations. It's written, I forgot, m dx, or in the calculus books, m dx plus n dy, and if m sub x and n sub y equals that, then you, you know that it's path independent. And you can, that's the solution, okay? You can just read the solution. It didn't make any difference how you got there. So those are called exact differential equations or path independent integrals, same thing. Okay, once you know it's an exact equation, you can write down the solution. So just a check for exactness. So if we check exactness, we have solution. So it's nothing more than what we do in undergraduate course. Okay. So here's an example. So this is just this case of surfaces. So let's uh, review that. So what does it say? The case of surfaces, okay, that's the easiest one. We have one algebraic relation, which is the Gauss. In fact, there's only one, there's only one non-trivial relationship here because all the rest are zero equals zero. It just says the Gauss is just from the determinant. So it says H11, H22 minus H12 squared equals some number, and that number is the Gauss curvature. Here. Okay. And it's times the uh, determinant of the metric, but that's not important for us. So it says this determinant is the, the fixed. So that's the Gauss relationship. How about Kadatsi? Kadatsi just says nothing very more. It's always the same. It says derivative across columns or rows doesn't make any difference because it's symmetric. So it says differentiate this guy with respect to x1 is equal to this guy differentiated with respect to x2 plus a error term because it's because of the geometry, because it's not flat. So here's the error term with the gammas. So, or you could have done it this way. Doesn't make any difference. So, so it says x1 differentiated with respect to x1 equals this guy differentiated with respect to x2 error term, this guy differentiated with respect to x1 minus this guy differentiated with respect to x2 error term. So what do we have? We have two equations, three unknowns, one algebraic relation, get rid of one of the unknowns, so two equations, two unknowns. How about Ricci? But Ricci is zero equals zero because it's mu and nu, in this case, it's just four, so mu and nu are both four, so it's a four, four upstairs, so the, the a's are all zero. So Ricci no effect. So there is no Ricci equation. It's just zero equals zero in surfaces. Now you see why, from the point of view of PDEs, everybody likes this one. Because what can a second order partial differential equation do? And this is quasi-linear. So what can a second order partial differential equation be? It's either hyperbolic or elliptic with a change of type across someplace. So that's why people like it. Okay? It's either the wave equation, he, either it looks like the wave equation, looks like Laplace's equation, and it can change its type where k equals zero. So far so good? Okay. So there I wrote down what the equations look like. So far, so good? Okay. So now let's uh, do where it gets harder. And it's getting late. So people are tired. So let's just introduce what happens, why it gets hard, 
the world changes completely when you go to man three manifolds. But this isn't the surprise because million dollar problem, where did problems get hard? Precisely when you got above surfaces into the three manifolds, if you go, as I enjoy going at night, to the Clay Institute website, which gives out the million dollars, they have a whole bunch of lectures on three manifolds, four manifolds, five manifolds, why it gets interesting from the point of view of topology. So the whole world changes when you change the number, this should have been an M, so it's a typo, from M2 to M3, so three dimensions, it gets harder. So you go from two space dimensions to three space dimensions, everything changes. So usually we like to think in math, if I understand two, I understand three. But in this case, everything changes from two to three. If you think of the million dollar prize, not the Poincaré, as I mentioned, is the other one, one of the other ones, is to prove or disprove global smooth solutions, global unique, smooth solutions to Navier-Stokes. So equations of fluid mechanics. Why is it hard conceptually? Because it's well understood in N equal to two space dimensions, everybody's happy. Nothing goes wrong. But you go add one more dimension, three space dimension, don't know what's happening. Not clear. Okay, so going from, it seems always going from two to three in these problems, adds problems. Now you could say, is it a coincidence that going from two to three in the geometry problem and going from two to three in Navier-Stokes both become hard? And my belief is it's not coincidental because in some sense they're the same problem. It's just a lot of notation, but if you interpret everything here, fluid mechanically, it's the same thing. So no wonder things get hard. There is no reason okay, uh, to think anything, either one will be any, either harder or easier than the other one. Okay, so let's continue. So now, let's look at the relations. First we have the Gauss relations. Well, how many R's are there? Before, in, in the case of surfaces, there was just one R, called the Gauss curvature. Here there are six R's. Okay, now if you think about it, if you reorder these and change the name to be R11, R12, R13, it would be the components of a six by six matrix, rather, sorry, three by three matrix. So, so if I wrote, okay, it's not the same. I just used the same, I used capital off of twice. Okay, so I hope it's not confusing. If you want, I'll make a little mark. So some new capital law. And how many, if it's symmetric, how many components are there in a symmetric three by three matrix? Not very deep, exactly six. So these R's correspond to the, comp to the components of a six by six matrix. What are these R's called? In fact, that's called the Ricci curvature. So exactly the same Ricci curvature that is discussed in Perelman's proof of the Poincaré conjecture occurs here in the three by three case. Now in higher dimensions, you go beyond, it won't be Ricci curvature anymore, but Okay, the three by three case, there it is, the Ricci curvature. Okay, so that was the, so we have six, I'll go five more minutes, I think people are getting tired, and I forgot what page I'm up to, 21. 
and there are 40 something pages so it's about halfway so it's a good place to stop and it's so let's do the count I use the eraser where's the uh, here so let's do the count it never hurts to do the count and I enjoy the counting so I use yellow? Okay. So we had six Gauss relations. Because there were six of the R's. How many Kodatis? Well remember Kodatis just say this derivative and this derivative are pairs. So you just count the pairs. So it's let's do for each column, each row. So that's one, two, right? Three. So three pairs from each row or column doesn't make any difference. Okay, so that's three plus three plus three is nine. Okay, so there's nine. Okay. But an easy check, and I have it down here, that from those nine, one doesn't is repeated. Okay, because if you do this one and do this one, so this is 2, 3 with 1, 2, and 3, 2 with 3, 1, and subtract, these two cancel, and you get a th one of those. So there were 9, but 1 is repeated, so there are really only 8. But how many H's are there? Well, there was 4, 5, 6, so there are 3. So there are 24 Kodatsi. The next one. Next one. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many Ricci's? Well, there are, you can write them down. Okay, there are nine. Okay, so if I add correctly, 6 and 24 is 30 plus 9 is 39. So we have 39 equations. How many unknowns? Well, there were the H's. We're three by three, right? And it's symmetric. So above the diagonal there are six. So it's six times three is 18 H's. How many A's? There were nine A's. Eighteen and nine is 27. So some things this we, must be too many equations. It doesn't mean there's no solution, it just means the equations are repeated somehow. And that's uh, important. It's important from the point of view of PDEs, not just, uh, okay, because if we don't identify exactly what PDEs we want to need to solve, we're not going to be able to do anything. And this is where it separates, as I view it, the applied math people who worked on this subject, okay, as I view it, from the pure math people. Because the pure math people seem to me to be trapped here. Because they haven't made use of the fact that you can change it to quasi-linear, and then the question is, which quasi-linear? So you have to identify which equations. Okay, so the answer was given, ironically, and now I'm going to stop, in a Richard Bloom, who was born in Romania, moved to Canada, and he did it in the 1940s and 1950s. The last bunch of, if you can't read German or French, the good news is the last papers or in English and Canadian journal, you can get it on the web. 
Okay. Absolutely, it's a little messy, but you can read the results very clearly. And then they, I got the, the reference to this paper. When I did my web search, I found this guy's paper. And then this guy says, he's a physicist, still alive, in Berlin. He wrote, quite well known. He has his own web page. He wrote a history of the life of Einstein in Berlin. Okay. Seems to be an extremely interesting guy. Never met him. And Gurner says in his paper, he says, why is it that nobody knows these results? He says, people in general, this is crucial for general relativity. He says, how can it be that this is such a fundamental stuff and nobody knows the results? So he wrote a paper in the 70s saying people should know this result. But as far as I can see, that paper had no impact on pure math people. It's maybe on relativity people, but no impact on pure math people. Okay, so the question is, which equations? And the answer is, it's easy. Okay. And I give the proof here. So I remember I was giving this lecture, I think at the Weizmann Institute not so long ago, and I reached this point, and somebody said, can you give me some idea of what the proof is? And I said, not only will I give you some idea, I'll give you the proof in one line. The proof, if you think about it, is, it's a manipulation and it's not hard to do. Okay, when it's here. But let's, it's getting late, so what's the point? First of all, you can reduce the Kadazi by three, because remember, Bianchi, second Bianchi is the divergence of the R's. And the R's are determined in terms of the H's by Gauss. So, so the Bianchi identity, which holds in general, has to, which were three of them, three second Bianchi's, means you have to be, have, three of these have to be repeated. If, you, if this one is satisfied. So if this one is satisfied, we can immediately subtract three. So we subtract three, so immediately, We've gotten around. So there are, instead of 20, one, 23 Kadatsis, there are 21. Okay, now you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You always say you don't have to be a rocket scientist. It doesn't hurt to be a rocket scientist. Okay, let's count. It's so trivial that you can see it here. Okay, let's do the computation together. They always say you travel on the airplane and somebody says, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm a mathematician. I say, oh, mathematics was my worst subject. Okay. But even that person okay, can see that 6 plus 21 is 27. If you can't see that, okay, then your education is certainly deficient. Okay. If 6 plus 21 is 27, what does it mean? It means these must be for free. Not very deep. Proving it, okay, a little work. Okay, so 6 plus 21 is 27. So what does it mean? It means we don't have to worry about solving Ricci because if you solved Gauss and Kadazi, you solved everybody. But it's not complete free lunch because even though this and this imply this, in the Kadazi equations, the A's still appear. So you have to do, you still have the A's, even though the, it's not a free lunch because the A's still appear in that equation. But again, that should not be a surprise. And that's for us now. Because, as I said, Navy is Stokes, oil is the same thing. So let's do this. Incompressible. So if nu is zero, this is the Euler equations of gas dynamics. Okay. If nu is not equal to zero, Navier-Stokes equations. Okay. And you have incompressibility. So you've seen this before. So what's the point? How many equations are here? U, let's say, is a vector in three-dimensional space. So the three equations. There and one equation here. Four equations. How many are knowns? 
three u's, one p. So the p still appears even though it's not written down any place. So of course, how do you find what the p is? You take the divergence of both sides. You get Laplacian p equals stuff. Okay, so you get an extra equation. That fact is exactly that the Laplacian p equals stuff is exactly analogous to the Ricci. So if you solve Navier-Stokes, immediately